OK. It says it's live. <laughs> I don't know how to tell. Sounds good to me. A little thi uh, I oh, now mine says live too. Yep, OK. And I went on my YouTube page. It does look like there's a lot of lag. Does there? Huh? Oh, yeah. I, I just heard my lag <laughs> on your end. <laughs> Let's see. The video has actually completely stopped at this point. For mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. Now you're moving again. Okay, and yeah, and I checked on YouTube, and it is definitely live, so. Okay. I guess we're recording. <laughs> Podcast episode one. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, hi, people. <laughs> uh, so, this is the Pages Podcast. This is, is me, Blue Caldwell, and Kate Centrin. And. Uh, we are going to go back and forth picking books every month and record this and talk about them. We have very different taste in books. <laughs> <laughs> so that should hopefully make it interesting. Um, so I, you I like kind of every like... other one, <laughs> <laughs> depending on what your tastes are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tend to like, although it's not going to hold true this month, but I tend to like kind of lighter and fluffier, and Kate tends to like heavier and depressing <laughs> and thought-provoking. <laughs> Angsty. <laughs> well, we've definitely got angst this month. Yay! So. <laughs> so the first pick was mine. Um, and I picked The Fault in Our Stars um, just because I had heard so much about it uh, last year um, when it came out, and, um, and I just heard nothing but good. And I knew it was about teenagers with cancer, so I knew it wasn't going to be a happy book. Um, but a lot of the people that I heard talk about it talked about... Um, that there was a lot of humor in it, and uh, they actually liked the um, sort of life affirmingness of it. And I thought that was true. <laughs> <laughs> and although I uh, I went in preparing prepared for it to be sad, um, I still wasn't quite prepared. <laughs> Tell me about it. I started reading it on the way out to my vacation. <laughs> I actually had to stop reading so that I wouldn't be depressed for the entire trip. Yeah. Yeah, I, Jeff uh... warned me. <laughs> he was like, you're going to put that down, right? I'm like, oh no, this, it's, Blue says this is funny. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of started out funny, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> I actually did find this to be a really humorous book. I did very much enjoy it and find that life affirmingness that that your recommendations said you would find. Uh, I I wasn't disappointed in that at all. In fact, I really liked the the depressing parts. I thought Yay! they were well done, quite thought provoking. Yeah, especially for um, a young young adult novel. Yeah, so so this is by John Green. This is he is in general a young adult writer. Um, I listened to the audio version, and there was an interview with him at the end, and um, he it was it was cute. He said like he doesn't care about adults. He <laughs> writes for teenagers. He likes teenagers, and um, he's happy if adults read his his work and like it. But. Um, he likes doing uh, young adult novels, and um, 
he is apparently very good at it. I, I from what I've read, I think this is his most well received novel, but um I think in general he's he's pretty popular uh, with young adults and adults. Um, he did have a pretty impressive resume. There were a couple um, uh, newspapers or something on there, like Washington Post or something was on his mm -hmm. resume. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I don't know exactly where. I know he's been writing for a long time, and I don't. Um, I don't know where else he's written before he started writing novels. Um, in his interview at the end of the of the book, he did say that he started out working in a cancer center, and that's kind of where this book came from. Um, and this was this was before his writing career had started. Um, but he worked in a cancer center, working with teenagers, and he said this book has been in his head since that time, and he's tried. A number of times to write it, um, and then, but it took him a long time to actually be successful at it. Um, but understandable. Uh, it's a very sensitive to uh, topic, and as somebody that is not going through the experience, only experiencing it through other people's eyes, no matter how well researched it is, it's really important to nail the emotions. Yeah. That he's worked so closely really speaks volumes because it it translated very well. Yeah, yeah, and I really liked. Um, I mean, there was a lot of uh, reference in the book to uh, cancer patients in fiction or nonfiction, um, and how they're, you know, usually portrayed as heroes and and as you know, braving their illness, you know, with with dignity and um, and how the characters just kind of thought that was nonsense, and I thought it provided a really real picture of what it is to be that kind of ill. Definitely agreed. There were several moments in there. Uh, where they were referencing the, the strength that you find just because you have to, not right. because that's something that you are born with statistically, it, it says, which is very true, uh, cancer kids or anybody going through anything is no more likely to be strong than the general population. And right. I love that because it speaks to the strength that we all have, that we all kind of pray that we don't ever need to find. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. And uh, before we go any further, I do want to say that we will, we're going to talk spoilers, so if you have not read this book, uh, don't listen if you, if you, <laughs> beware, <laughs> yeah, if you don't want to be spoiled, because I, I think it's kind of impossible to talk about this without talking about what happens, um, because uh, starting now, one of the reasons I was not prepared is that when this book starts, uh, the the heroine of the book is Hazel, and going in, you know that she's sick, and you know that she's dying, and it's from the first page she says, you know, I have cancer, I'm dying. Um, she goes to a support group, um, forced by her mom, uh, and ends up meeting Gus um, and starting a relationship. And although I kind of saw it coming, <laughs> I was prepared for Hazel to die. <laughs> I, I was pretty clear that it was not going to be the death we thought it would be um, because of, thank God you already said the spoiler thing, um, because of the way it plays out with us anticipating so clearly Hazel's death. And the setup that they have of the book in the fiction, mm -hmm. uh, cutting off the way life cuts off. Mid-sentence, you're just done. It's, it's not anticipated. I thought that was a pretty good setup for, by the way, this will probably not end up, uh, it, this is going to be as real true to life as possible, in which case, who knows? You might think that you're going to die any minute. You might outlive everybody in the book. Right. Um, 
So, in fact, I was actually prepared for it to stop mid-sentence. <laughs> I have in my notes somewhere in here, uh, it's, uh, oh God, our character's going to die mid-sentence and we're not going to get to finish this book. <laughs> well, it's funny, there, there's also a Q&A that I will link to in the show notes on John Green's website. And uh, he talks about, because um, in, okay, so, so in the book, they reference another book that does end mid-sentence. It's kind of the um, the book that Hazel and then uh, Gus, her boyfriend, are obsessed with, um, which in the book is about a cancer patient. Um, and he says, and the, they talk about in the book at one point how the author has a responsibility to actually end the book. Um, and John Green said that he that that he felt that was a true statement. Like he he did not want to end it. I mean, it he did cut me off. End it. Yeah, <laughs> he did end it. You know, somewhat ambiguously. Like you you don't know the ending ending, but um, no no mid sentence. He he didn't do a Sopranos. <laughs> I thought that we got a lot of really good closure with it. We've got yeah. a storyline for Hazel's mother. We've got a storyline for Hazel's father. Right. Uh, we've got a pretty clear direction for Hazel, even though we don't like it. Uh, the only one that I don't feel that we have a really clear picture of what's going to happen is Isaac. Right. And he was a but supporting think, character anyway. Right. And I, I mean, I think the implication was just he's going to go on and, and live his life. I mean, he's the only one in the book that... I mean, he gets a damaged life, but he gets a life. I mean, there's always the possibility, I suppose, of his, his cancer recurring, but um, mm -hmm. it doesn't sound like that was a high likelihood with the kind of cancer that he had. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, it didn't spell it out for you, but, yes, I think it, everything was, was pretty clearly implied. Um, and... You know, I, I felt like Hazel's obsession with this book was really the obsession with knowing that her parents were going to live on without her. Um, and the closer that she wanted was just knowing that, you know, they weren't going to get divorced and fall apart just because they didn't have her to take care of anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I thought that was all good. Um, Absolutely. And I, I think that was a very necessary realization in the family dynamic that it's not just about talking about Hazel, it's also about uh, not sheltering Hazel and treating her like a child, saying, yes, you're going to die, there is going to be a life after you, and we have built something around that. Right. So that, that she get, does get that closure. It's addressing a closure before the inevitable. Yeah, yeah, and it, I, I thought that was good, guys. I mean, I, I imagine that's, I mean, that's a big part of being, you know, so ill and knowing that you're not going to be around. I mean, if you have, spirit, especially for a teenager at that age, you know, you're going to worry about what your parents are going to do. But even if you're an adult, like, and if if you're married or you know in a relationship with someone. Um, it's not just you. Like you, you only have so much control over when you're going to go, but you know that you're leaving them behind. Yeah, I, I thought a lot of the treatment of this book was really good because that that is something that everything in this is stuff that you deal with as a teenager anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, he created a very realistic crisis, uh, cancer. Right. But it, it was easily translatable to just about any other crisis that you could go through as a teenager or as an adult. Um, I know that as a, a child, uh, child, as a teenager and into my 20s, I really worried about my mom. Um, right. She's relatively isolated and, and was working very, very hard. And I actually had a discussion with one of my professors of what's going to happen to her when she ages. Is this something that uh, we've got as a society prepared for? And of course I was being paranoid, but that's what you do when you're that age. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and, and the whole relationship between Hazel and Gus was very, was very, very teenager, first love. Oh, yeah. Um, 
that when intense. It, yes. And when it started, <laughs> when the book started, like I was like, oh, this is a little more young adult than I thought. <laughs> because it was, you know, especially those teenagers who are very smart teenagers and want to show off how smart they are in um, the big speeches and the big words and <laughs> it was the soliloquies awkward. that you've actually practiced mm -hmm. that make everything really awkward. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I thought that it actually. I mean, you know, that I I'm so uncomfortable with um, squishy feelings. Especially mm -hmm. in literature or in movies, I, I'm literally that person that will, I can watch a surgery on TV, no problem. Kissing, I have to turn away. It really <laughs> bothers me. Uh, <laughs> so I was, I was not looking forward to this part of the book at all. And this was doable. Like It, it, it was realistic enough. Uh, acknowledging the sappiness, but also acknowledging uh, that the sappiness is part of this phase of life. Uh, that it was doable. I didn't actually have to close the book. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I, um, I am also in a romance book club, so <laughs> I, I read a whole lot about kissing. Um, <laughs> How we work out as such good friends, Blue? I do not know. <laughs> <laughs> so, see, this is where the opposite thing comes in. Um, <laughs> no romances next week. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I thought the romance was handled very well and was very sweet. Um, and uh, and I, that's where all of the, a lot of the life affirming stuff came in because I mean, you know, you end up. Like I said, I was prepared going in for, for Hazel to be sick and dying, um, but it ends up that Gus, her boyfriend, has a recurrence of his cancer, and, and he is the one that ends up dying, which, um, like I said, I kind of saw coming, but still was not prepared for, and um, that was the part where I had to, I was going to my exercise class and had to turn the book off. <laughs> Because I was just bawling, <laughs> uh, and I kind of had to to selectively listen after that. <laughs> it's like, okay, I need to go to work in a half an hour. I can't listen to the book right now. Um, but uh, you know, they they continue on um, even through his horrible, horrible um, decline. Um, I was very glad that they didn't gloss over. Uh, yeah, the fact that, that they delved into that and said, this is what it is, it gets messy, um, it was so important to the book. Yeah. By the way, though, the one thing that I, I felt was uh, kind of unbelievable, uh, it, like they're very good about being believable the entire way through. I even believed that these teenagers really are that eloquent. Mm -hmm. uh, was the fact that Hazel didn't catch on about the reoccurrence uh, when the Make-A-Wish Foundation sent Gus uh, to Amsterdam. I thought if, if Hazel is that brilliant, he, if he was really cured, if there was no cancer in him, there's no way he would have gotten the wish. And, and they made note of that. Right. But then she, I guess she's so excited about Amsterdam that she doesn't think about it. The thing is that it's a couple weeks lead up. I think at some point a smart girl like Hazel would have said, okay, Gus, obviously you're not telling me something here. What's going on? Right. Although I think I think that might fall into the category of like you don't want to know. That is very possible. You know, like I, you, you just don't see it because you don't want to see it. Because hey, cause I when they when they did with when, when that scene came up and he just said like oh you know um, I uh, the the fact that I lost my leg they they still gave me the wish and I was like okay that I don't know that that's plausible but sure <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how the Make a Wish Foundation works <laughs> maybe, maybe once you get it that. they can't resend it. <laughs> 
I love it. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess that is possible. Um, I hadn't thought about that, so I'm going to have to think about that. Um, I thought it seemed like a very convenient point for Hazel to suddenly go dumb. But it, I did feel like there was... Um, like, I felt like everything was a little bit exaggerated in the book. Um, not not necessarily in a bad way, but just to make the story work. Yeah. Um, you know, the uh, them going and meeting. So they, if, if just I guess in case you haven't read the book, um, you know, they, they go, they use uh, Gus's wish to go and meet the author of this book that they're obsessed with in um, Amsterdam. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, <laughs> and uh, Van, Hout Van Houten um, is just a horrible, <laughs> He's a lovely drunkard. <laughs> yeah, which, um, which I loved. I loved him. <laughs> <laughs> He's horrible. It's great. <laughs> um, but it, it did... Like, it, I don't know, it just seems, like, everything seemed exaggerated. Like, he was, he was so awful. Um, and, um, you know, Hazel was so sweet, and Gus was so cool. Uh, I, I mean, I felt like, I felt like the characters had depth, but I also felt like it felt a little young adult in that sense. That, yeah that and everyone was so what they were. For a young adult novel, it had very good character development. I generally don't like reading YA novels at all because they dumb down. I don't feel like this was dumbed down at all. No. I felt like this was almost written through the eyes of a teenager, in which case everything's dialed up a notch because reality's dialed up a notch at that age. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. But um, so, what did you think I, of Ben Houghton? I did not read any of the uh, of the ending. Actually, I thought it was a really good ending. I thought the wrapping up was um, very well done. It gave Gus final words to Hazel, which was very necessary. Um, I am a little. I did not read any of um, the literature around this book. I didn't look at any discussion groups or anything so that I could come into this discussion fresh. So at the risk of sounding like I'm trying to make more of it than it is, I saw the entire book as an analogy um, for life through war. Uh, there were a lot of different mentions uh, of, like Hazel Grace had said, you know, I'm like a grenade, I'm going to explode mm -hmm. at any minute. Uh, Gus was obsessed with playing this um, Judge Dredd type army uh, combatant, uh, first person shooter. Um, and then towards the end, uh, when Gus is talking about his personality versus Hazel's when dealing with uh, their, their diseases, uh, he said that uh, Hazel tries not to hurt other people by not affecting so many, whereas he was that person that would always try and throw himself in front of the bus to save the kids. Uh, he wanted to be known and to make heroic acts. And uh, he had mentioned uh, the revolution that you think you're doing for good and it turns out into a dictatorship, how every good act that you try and do uh, potentially does more harm than good. And I, I saw this as an analogy for two different ways of living, kind of the FDR do heroic things all the time. Oh my god, there's a K cat back there. Sorry. Um, <laughs> versus the uh, Hazel Gandhi uh, approach of do no harm. She's so cute. <laughs> That's funny. 
Um, and you can live your life through those. Uh, is that Gwen? Oh, God, I got to meet that cat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Really distracted by furry things and shiny things. <laughs> what I thought is like you can live your life through this FDR, be bold, be brave, or this kind of Gandhi-ish, do no harm method. And either way, it's going to be problematic. Um, and if you, I'm not sure where. Back to the Van Houten, Houten. Houghton. <laughs> I'm not sure how that character played into that. Because he was obviously supposed to be symbolic of somebody. I liked the idea of him being symbolic of God, like the character in his book, because he's just a drunkard who does things haphazardly. But I don't think that's what the author was trying to do with him. I just like the idea of God that has no fucking clue. <laughs> um, I I thought that, I that think he kind of... reference might be especially pertinent because of. Sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> There's a little bit of a lag on my end, <laughs> yeah, folks. Yeah, we've my got fault. lag. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and finish what you were um, saying. The uh, the wars that we're involved in as. Uh, U.S., but especially most of the wars that we've been heading up in the last 15, 20 years have been very, we keep trying to do good and end up creating more mess and more problems uh, with the best of intentions. And I think it's very possible that, that Gus was a U.S. type character. Um, just a thought I was playing around with. Yeah. Um. To me, it was kind of the, um, the kind of the dichotomy of, of wanting to be famous um, and doing you know things on a large scale and being happy with just affecting your personal world um, and living on a small scale. And I think Van Houten kind of encompassed both of those. But showed how you know you can you can be famous and you can have touched people and made a a hugely positive influence on um, you know multiple people's lives. That still doesn't make you a happy or even successful or even functional person. Um, because he <laughs> certainly wasn't. Okay, that works for me. No. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a very good point, where he did not focus on the things that mattered. He was not good to his family or the people that were close to him. Yeah, and, and it didn't... I mean, I think on some level it mattered to him that, that he mattered, that, or that his book mattered so much to, to Hazel and Gus, but didn't take away any of his pain. I mean, he was, you know, an an out drowning in it mess, and and knowing that his book was successful and matters didn't mean anything to him really. That's very very true, so, and that's exactly what Gus would have liked to have gotten. Mm -hmm. and didn't get the opportunity to achieve. And I, I really right. liked that aspect of Gus. I could really relate to it. I, I'm one of those people that like gets out of the superhero movie and can't believe that I can't save the world. It's depressing to me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but when was the last time that you had the opportunity to lift a bus and save all the children in it, you know? Right. Um, and almost that that lack of opportunity to be to live a grand life, um, I could really relate to that in him. And yeah. granted, I'm not dying, and like there's nothing on my horizon that says that I will be dead any sooner than the rest of us. Um, but I like the fact that again, it, it everything in this book could be 
related to an everyday life that doesn't have this looming crisis. Right. Um, yeah, and for me, I, re I related more to, to Hazel um, because I think I, I tend to be happy just living in a smaller way. Um, like, I would, I would like to, I guess, create great things, but not necessarily for the recognition, just for myself. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I, I could I definitely see you more of a Hazel character that, that live quietly and do your best in the back. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I am not a uh, center of attention kind of person. <laughs> Oddly for somebody who sings opera and spins fire. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That, that's why I don't do those things professionally. <laughs> <laughs> Computers are really good for hiding behind. <laughs> so I okay. will say I thought this book was fantastic at oh, at good. doing uh, one-liners. There was a lot yeah. of like little bits that you could take out and apply to other situations. That yeah. Were just beautiful one-line witticisms. Uh, that one about the broccoli. Uh, uh, the existence of broccoli does not negate the, uh, does not change the, the taste of chocolate. Yeah. Uh, is her argument to um, that age-old witticism that uh, if, you, if you had all, uh, all joy, uh, if it was all joy, you wouldn't know how wonderful it was. You need the pain to, to feel that joy. And it, right. I liked her answer. I understand what the, the phrase is trying to mean and, and why her answer isn't a very good answer to it. But, God, it's a good one-liner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is kind of, I mean, because there's a lot of talking about, you know, the platitudes and things that, that people say, um, to sort of compensate for suffering, and uh, it doesn't really make the suffering suck any less. No. So, yay! We both liked it. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Score one. You gave something with love in it, and I still liked it. Love and kids. God. Awful things <laughs> happening to people. <laughs> Teenage angst. Yay! Yeah. So um, another reason that I, I uh, had picked this because, is because the movie's coming out this summer. Um, the U.S. release is uh, June 6th. Um, I will probably go see this, or at least see it at some point. I don't know if I'll go see it in the theater, but I will probably see it at some point just because I'm curious is how they will um, translate it to screen. Um, I, I don't expect to like it as much as the book. <laughs> Probably not. A lot of the stuff that, that's endearing about the book I don't know is translatable. Uh, it, the over the topness of some of it that makes the book work when you put it on screen might not work so well. Yeah. Um, but I can see, like, if, if I had been a teenager when I read this, I, I probably would have just, I mean, I, I really liked it as an adult, but um, I think it would have made a huge impact on me as a teenager just because... Um, a lot of what was in the book would probably have been newer ideas uh, at the time. Um, yeah. And I, I'm sure I would have been, you know, ecstatic for the movie. I'm sure there, there are lots of teenagers out, out there who can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very happy for those teenagers. Uh, <laughs> I, not not to trash talk any of the other young adult stuff that's out there right now. It's just that it's nice to see 
the things that aren't dumbed down, the things that talk to the issues that you think of as the time, at the time, uh, with a reasonable amount of depth and understanding, mm -hmm. um, without just feeding them uh, crap. Yeah, <laughs> well, and I, I think this, and and um, it was in the the Audible interview that John Green talked about this that you know um, he feels like young adult fiction has gone a, has gone a, gone the um, you know he said the vampire route but you know the supernatural and post apocalyptic and um, not that there's not a place for all of that I love all of it right. but but well rounded repertoire is quite nice <laughs> yeah. and there's kind of a, a tradition of this kind of young adult lit literature that um, you know, he feels is kind of falling by the wayside, and I, I think uh, I am not an expert at young adult lit literature, but I would guess that that's probably true. So it's nice to see that there is um, still room for for a book like this. Yes. Um, and I. Uh, in a related link, uh, there was something I came across uh, before I read this. I swear, the, the, you know the thing that happens when you read something about a subject and then suddenly, like everything is about what you're reading about. Oh yes, I feel like that's kind of happened, and I would really like cancer stuff to to go away. Uh, <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> Because <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm seeing it everywhere at the moment, um, and but um, before I started reading this, somebody had posted a uh, video about um, a woman on Twitter who uh, is sort of her. I mean, she eventually died, but her um, path through cancer was kind of documented through Twitter. I don't know if it's real or not. Nobody seems to know if it's real or not. But it's um, it's very moving in the same way that this book is moving. Um, just sort of a reminder of the, um, I guess, fleetingness of, of life and the fact that, you know, things can change kind of unexpectedly in any moment and um, that you should appreciate and take advantage of the, the time that you have and so um, I will include that link in the show notes because it was it's a neat video real or not mm -hmm. uh, there is a um, a foreword in the book actually that I really liked that that speaks to exactly that real or not uh, I don't I'm sure it was in your audiobook as well but it, it was just a foreword in my copy about how um, there were rumors that part of this book was real and the author was saying it's it's not real and any discussion on whether this is real or not um, lessens the value of a book that is completely fiction and I really loved that statement that yeah. we need to elevate uh, fiction as a method of communication and con contemplation just because it's not real doesn't make it not valuable. Right. Um, so yes, it's nice to know if things actually are real or not, but the fact that it makes you contemplate is is in itself important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember if that was in the beginning of the audiobook or not, or if it was just sort of uh, part of his interview at the end. But but yeah, I do think that was in there somewhere. Um, and is is very true. I mean, I, I think some of the book it was definitely drawn from his experiences with cancer patients, um, but um, that doesn't really matter one way or the other in the end. I think that that lent a um, sort of a reality to it that he had actual experience, but. Yay! Agreed. 
We like well, the same um, book. <laughs> <laughs> Next week, uh, we will be uh, going over uh, Bobcat and Other Stories by Rebecca Lee, which is a book of short stories that I have uh, as my World Book Night uh, pick. And if anybody is not familiar with World Book Night, it is too late to be a giver, which is sad. Um, but please get in on it next year. It's this fantastic program where a bunch of publishers get together and give out free copies of uh, some pre-selected books. But you do get to give a list and say these are the books of the ones you've chosen that I'm interested in. And then you hand out 20 copies of this book just for free on the street. You, you have to say where you're giving it. Um, but it, the intention of it is to get non-readers reading. So uh, last year, Blue and I did it, and uh, we, we were on a little team. We sat there at the L holding up the book, saying things like, this is a feminist dystopian novel. That is actually what I said, <laughs> because I had a Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> actually, you try actually and find Kate did most of the talking. I stood back and took pictures. <laughs> A very important aspect of World Book Night. <laughs> She's kind of the social media fingers in all of it person. Uh, and so it, it's a wonderful program. You can get in on it and look it up, World Book Night. Um, Bobcat, Bobcat and Other Stories I have not read yet, but uh, I read some of one of them. Uh, beautifully written. And I really like short stories because uh, you can get... A wonderful, a wonderful taste, taste of, of thought, thought, and then you can put it down and go to bed and go to yoga. So I've got high hopes that for that one. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, yeah, it looks neat. I, I, I don't know much about it other than just sort of reading the quick description of it. So uh, I am excited to read it. And it's got and a beautiful, got a beautiful illustration, illustration on the cover. On the cover. Love I love that, that ratty bobcat, bobcat running across the front. Uh, um, so what else, so what are, else you are you reading right now, right now Blue? Um, I just finished, finally, it, it kind of took me months to read this book, um, only because uh, I don't have much physical reading time. But um, Cinnamon and Gunpowder, which... Um, I don't think got a lot of press, but I really, really, really like this book. Um, it is uh, historical fiction. Um, I think I mentioned this to you a while, like a while back when I started reading it months and months ago. Um, but historical fiction about a female pirate who kidnaps a uh, chef back in, um, I believe it was the, the early 1800s. Um, and basically takes him prisoner and makes him cook for her uh, in return for not killing him. Um, and he ends up, yeah, uh, he ends up um, kind of going along on uh, a lot of adventures. And um, it's it's really well written. It's a really unique premise. Um, I don't think it's meant to be tremendously historically accurate, although um, I would guess a lot of the food description is probably um, researched and, and fairly accurate. Um, it's brutal. It is a very violent book, uh, so it doesn't really tone down um, of piracy and the reality of what that means. Um, and all of that, it just it's, it's a really good book. Um, and I, uh, I, I think it should have gotten, I mean, it got good reviews in the places it got reviews, but, um, you know, it wasn't, it, it, I don't think it's, it's tremendously well known, probably because it doesn't fit comfortably into any one genre. I was about to say, I'm sure it's very hard to find people that are foodies and bakers that are also good with stomaching violence. Right. <laughs> yeah. Not, it, the Venn diagram is, is like this, which is a reference to our book, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, 
But I just finished that, and I, I highly recommend it. And I'm also reading um, The Midnight Witch, was a, which is an advanced reader copy that I got uh, from Goodreads um, and is historical fiction and is kind of slow moving, but is, is good so far. And A Winter's Tale, um, I'm listening to the audiobook of. Uh, I generally have a real book, or a printed book, and an audiobook going at the same time. Um, and the book, and and well written and good, it kind of has that um, sort of magical realism that Neil Gaiman tends to do. Um, not necessarily his style of writing, but it reminds me of that kind of mythological, um, historical. It's it's historical fiction, but um, with kind of magic and and stuff included. Um, uh, I saw the movie. The movie is not very good. <laughs> it's it's uh, kind of dumbed down. Oh, did I lose you? Uh, for a second there, it looked like it, oh. it was kind of bouncing out, but I, I hear you again. Do you hear me okay? okay? Yep, I hear you again. So, Winter Sale, book good so far, movie not good. Okay, good. <laughs> I, I just... <laughs> Synapsis, bam, done. <laughs> I love it. Um... millionth time, um, the Max, which was chosen because of the young adult novel that we just finished. Um, Sam Keith is the one that does the art and story for it, and uh, in his little foreword, I thought related really well to what we just read, he had said um, that his book, and it's very true, the first two uh, trade issues of the Max are, are very angsty and very over the top with the um, fantastical bits. Um, mm -hmm. But he says that yes, of course it's a little over the top, of course it's filled with angst because it's written about a time period in our life. All of his characters are arrested in development from uh, trauma that happened in their, their teenage years. Um, it's that angsty and everybody feels it's important because at that time period in your life you feel like everything's important and then he pauses and says because it is yeah. and, and I really liked that um, the acknowledgement that there is something to it that heightened sense of reality at that stage um, but at any rate it's a ridiculously fantastic book that uh, I, I've owned the entire series it's uh, six or so uh, trades and every time I read that and I've been reading it since the 90s um, I get something new out of every reading uh, there's another layer that I didn't catch before uh, and, and it is one of those that that helped me get through a lot of trauma when I was a teenager so uh, I would highly recommend that. Uh, read the first two for the art. Read the third on because it's about uh, emotional compromise, which is not something that gets discussed nearly enough on that kind of an epic level. Yeah. Um, I'm also reading March, still, by Geraldine Brooks. <laughs> uh, I, I think at some point I'm going to have to admit that I'm just 20 pages from the end, and I'm not picking it back up because I don't feel like shooting myself in the head. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Geraldine Brooks is really great at weaving a tale that makes you want to blow your brains out. Um, this one is about uh, the story Little Women from the perspective of the father and it is it is brilliant um, but it does get into the depths of slavery and the war and the complexities of liberation of the cotton uh, farms on such a real and personal basis uh, that it's hard to pull through. Um, so yeah, 20 pages to the end and have been for a month now. 
We <laughs> <laughs> got through the first part of the book, you know, everything to the last 20 pages in, I think, three days. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it sounds like a, a. I read the synopsis, and just from what you've said, it sounds like a pretty depressing book. <laughs> One of my girlfriends, uh, who uh, I have brunch with periodically, I had brunch. Oh, what are you reading? I'm like, oh, March, Geraldine Brooks. She goes, oh, God, Geraldine Brooks? Ugh, shoot me now. I'm like, <laughs> what do you mean by that? She's like, exactly what I said. <laughs> That's hilarious. I, I have never read The Max, but The Max, uh, I have heard, is really good. Oh, you haven't read it. You're, it's it's going to your house. I all, My it bookshelves may, are to the left to here. Care. I'm actually pointing at all of the novels for The Max yeah. right there. Docs, um, Docs may have them. I, I think he's read them. Oh, of course Docs will have them. He has the classics. He'll have this one. <laughs> <laughs> I like everything on the shelf I've seen when cat's sitting. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other nerdy stuff that you want to mention? Uh, no, it looks like you've got uh, a good nerdy mention here. Uh, I just wanted to do a little shout out to Veronica Mars. Um, not book related, but I am currently rewatching the series, and it is an awesome series. Uh, and the movie is coming out next month, March 14th. Uh, it's going to be at South by Southwest apparently on March 8th, but um, that doesn't do me any good here. <laughs> yeah. So I, I am excited about that. I've, I've been really enjoying rewatching it. Um, I, I, I watched the whole of, the, of it originally, but um, kind of as I was working and you know, not entirely paying attention, and so I paid attention a lot more this time. I have actually not seen any of the Veronica Mars. Um, I'm very bad at watching series. I, I'm a good nerd. I'm just a bad TV watcher. Uh, so I, I have not seen those, and I get yelled at regularly, but, you know, I haven't watched I, Buffy either, so my nerd yeah. card is just gone on those. I was I was about to say, I'd look, I, I don't know if you would... Like it or not, I mean, it's very teenager-y. Um, uh, see? <laughs> uh, it, it is kind of, I mean, I, I have not watched all of Buffy, but I feel like Veronica Mars is very much um, similar to Buffy. There's just the vampires are rich people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> see, the, the part that didn't interest me was the entire plot on Veronica Mars. It's you know a teenager that is essentially a detective, from what I understand, yeah, and she's so much smarter than all of the adults around her that are not figuring this out. And that's where it falls short for me. Is I was a teenager, and I was an idiot. <laughs> I think for the most part all teenagers, I mean your brain is literally not developed yet. It was more developed and then it, it restructures itself during that time period so it turns a little bit to mush. So it can restructure itself which is a very good thing to do um, but it doesn't really leave your detective skills intact. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> I was not overly interested, although I'm sure it's a lovely series. Yeah, I love it. I, I don't know that you would like it. <laughs> Good thing to know about me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, where to find us? Uh, you can find us at the, the pagespodcast.com website. Um, we are also on Goodreads. We have a group there, which you are welcome to join and um, talk about the books with us. Uh, we are on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're on Google+. Plus. Um, all of those links are on the website, so uh, we are relatively easy to find. <laughs> as much so as possible. <laughs> um self-promotion stuff, where can people find you uh, on the web? Uh, 
KateCitron.com is my graphic design portfolio. Uh, I have illustration and illustrated blog, uh, Yoga Badassery, and that can be found at blogspot.yogabadassery.com. I think that's right. Um, I think that's right. <laughs> I, I usually have to ask you for that. Thank you, Blue. Um, <laughs> and Kate Citron at all of the various social media. Uh, and I am the same. You? you can you can find me at uh, at Blue Caldwell pretty much anywhere on the web. I um, <laughs> am at blue <laughs> bluecaldwell.com uh, at Blue Caldwell uh, on all the social media networks. I tend to be on Twitter uh, the most. Um, I am also around on Goodreads. Um, I have some other book clubs that are out there. Um, the Food for Thought book club, which is not mine, but I am a part of. Um, it has a group on book reads, on good reads. Um, I am sort of the organizer for the Chicago um, Vaginal Fantasy Hangouts. Um, that is Felicia Day's uh, Paranormal Romance book club. Um, she does the, <laughs> the very different out. tastes, folks. <laughs> very, very different. different. Taste. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, if you are in the Chicago area and are interested, you can look that up. Um, there is a local hangout index on the official Vaginal Fantasy uh, Goodreads group, um, and then we also have a group on Google Plus uh, called Chicago Paranormal Romance. Um, I think that's the right name. And then I am also part of a podcast called Universal Geek. Um, Yay! Yay! That uh, <laughs> Jeff, Kate's boyfriend, is part of. And uh, our good friend, John D. Francis, uh, it's actually, he is the head podcaster there. Um, and that is universal-geek.com. So we are everywhere. Lots of places. <laughs> We're taking over the web. <laughs> <laughs> Very slowly, little corner by little corner. <laughs> All right, we're starting so, at different ends of the alphabet of the internet. I'm starting off at yoga, and you're starting <laughs> off at books, and we're going to meet in the middle at M. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much. This Thank is you. our very first episode. Right. <laughs> and hopefully it recorded and everything, and uh, this was not for naught. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had fun and I got wine. Yeah, it was good. funny to watch. So, okay. Uh, I guess I will see you later, and we'll see anybody who happens to watch this next month. Yay! Hey. Good night. Night, sweetie. Night, kitty cats. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.